Howdy, friend. Welcome to the Meta Dojo. Don't know if anybody will be joining me today, but I am very grateful and very excited to have such cool lighting conditions behind me. Well, I read this lovely book that has found its way to my attention called The Way to Love. It's a lovely little book. Little book. I'm going to read it. And if I, anything, if I have anything to say about it, I'll talk. I'm feeling very ensconced in the love paradigm at the moment. In an effort to acquiesce to the intensity of existence and open up to the reality of the necessity of being sensitive in order to love and express freedom and God, not a theist at all, but um, there's no other words to use for this kind of stuff except religio mythical terminology. <clears throat> Perhaps another meta dojo artist joins me, then there will be a discussion. Otherwise, there will be only my reading. These are a multiplicity of short meditations written by the, uh, well, I don't know much about Anthony DeMillo. I uh, might even not be saying his last name right. But the avenue by which this book made it to me was a profoundly meaningful feeling avenue. And didn't take much glancing to get a deep sense of giving from this book. And I want to share that sense of giving and see if any of the uh, experience I'm having resonates. Okay. <laughs> This is not a suit and tie. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his life? It's Matthew 16, 26. This meditation is called On Profit and Loss. Recall the kind of feeling you have when someone praises you when you are approved, accepted, applauded, and contrast that with the kind of feeling that arises within you when you look at a sunset or a sunrise or nature in general, when you read a book or watch a movie that you thoroughly enjoy. Get the taste of this feeling and contrast it with the first, namely, the one that was generated within you when you were praised. Understand that the first type of feeling comes from self-glorification, self-promotion, it is a worldly feeling. The second comes from self-fulfillment. It is a soul feeling. Here's another contrast. Recall the kind of feeling you have when you succeed, when you've made it, when you get to the top, when you win a game or a bet or an argument, and contrast it with the kind of feeling you get when you really enjoy the job you're doing, you're absorbed in, the action that you're currently engaged in. And once again, notice the qualitative difference between the worldly feeling and the soul feeling. Yet another contrast. Remember what you felt like when you had power, when you were the boss, people looked up to you, took orders from you, or when you were popular. And contrast that worldly feeling with the feeling of intimacy, companionship, the times you thoroughly enjoyed yourself in the company of a friend, or with a group in which there was fun and laughter. Having done this, attempt to understand the true nature of worldly feelings, namely the feeling of self-promotion, self-glorification. They are not natural. They were invented by your society and your culture to make you productive and to make you controllable. These feelings do not produce the nourishment and happiness that is produced when one contemplates nature or enjoys the company of one's friends or one's work. They are meant to produce thrills, excitement, and emptiness. Then observe how you 
Then observe yourself in the course of a day or a week and think about how many actions of yours are performed, how many activities engaged in that are uncontaminated by the desire for these thrills, these excitements that only produce emptiness, the desire for attention, approval, fame, popularity, success, or power. And take a look at the people around you. Is there a single one of them who has not become addicted to these worldly feelings? A single one who is not controlled by them, hungers for them, spends every minute of his, her waking life consciously or unconsciously seeking them. When you see this, you will understand how people attempt to gain the world and in the process, lose their soul for they live empty, soulless lives. And here's a parable of life for you to ponder on. A group of tourists sits in a bus that is passing through a gorgeously beautiful country, lakes and mountains and green fields and rivers, but the shades of the bus are pulled down. They do not have the slightest idea of what lies beyond the windows of the bus. And all of the time of their journey is spent squabbling over who will have the seat of honor in the bus and who will be applauded, who will be well considered. And so they remain till the journey's end. <clears throat> I've spent some of the most patient moments of my life on long bus rides, looking out the window. I'm very grateful that the shades were not closed. And I'm very grateful that there was not a status competition for any of the seats on that bus. I just didn't want an aisle seat personally. And my other comment on this gorgeous meditation on the difference between approval and engagement is that for me, a good way to break down the dichotomy between how we spend most of our attention energy to me seems to be between mate signaling, what do we do to make ourselves look presentable to find a mate and wounded child management. What are we doing to deal with our own traumatic histories? What are we doing in response to our real time environment that is actually a response to our traumatic histories that have been left unaddressed? And that can include our families, our cultures, our societies, all the way to the intense primate evolutionary basis of our actual minds. We have an incredible burden of incompassionate, uncompassionate momentum to work through. And in what seems to be literally, clearly, obviously, the most uncertain and geopolitically tumultuous time in my personal existence in which real violence in our local space is more really possible and more really present than it has been, in which the bifurcation of narratives is so gobsmackingly intense that my aim to simply empathize with as many positions as I possibly can is causing my uh, causing my mind to melt a little bit into a wonderful soup of uncertainty because I really don't know what's going on and I know I don't know and I know I can't know and I know we're too in the thick of it to have enough context to know. And I am deeply respectful of all perspectives. And I'm friends with all perspectives. I have black women cop customers who I've known for 15 years who took me and their kid to movies back in the day. She's lovely. I have anarcho-capitalist friends I met from podcasts who are deeply committed to the principles of diminishing state power and the abolition 
of the police appears to them to be moving things in the right direction towards decentralization and towards community engagement and community standards controlling community behaviors and keeping communities beautiful places to live as opposed to uh, the enforcement class <laughs> of the uh, institutions. <clears throat> this is not to say that uh, I, don't, I don't know if we're going to get more intense enforcement classes from more federal. I don't know. I'm not, not here to say my opinions on um, the world. I am, see, I am seeing many whom I love and respect more and more unable to find the space of love in which conversations can happen and searching for that space of being deeply interested in the bizarre reality of all of us only seeing from behind our own eyes and only having the vantage point we have and attempting to construct some, some semblance of a coherent uh, cause and effect structure that helps us make sense of what's going on. I am abandoning that more or less, well, valiantly attempting to continue on with the journey of trying to figure things out. Um, I'm deeply open to being wrong and to coming to each experience with a mind to learn. I am looking for the passionate and compassionate from all sides. Okay, I'm gonna read another. Uh, how's the light? Oh yeah, it's some beautiful light. I'm gonna read another essay and then I think I'll play a song. Why not? And then we'll call it the Meta Dojo, unless by some miracle somebody pops in, which would be a unexpected seeing as I have not been actually a reliable steward of the Meta Dojo. I keep not showing up. The last two weeks have been occupied by other things. Give myself one more valid excuse, but, and one less valid excuse. But here I am persevering onward and continuing to attempt to meet my commitments to more myself than anybody else. And uh, if you happen to be here with me now, I love you very much. And I appreciate spending some time with me. Discipleship. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Woof, that's brutal. Jesus Christ. I should read the Bible more. Not religious. Okay. Luke 14, 26. Spiritual. Yes or no? Just, okay. Take a look at the world you see and the unhappiness around you and in you. There's an endless parade of unhappiness around me and within me. Do you know what causes this unhappiness? I think I do. I think it's the separate self. That could be wrong. You will probably say loneliness or oppression or war or hatred or atheism. I won't say atheism. <laughs> okay. You will be wrong. There's only one cause of unhappiness. The false beliefs you have in your head, beliefs so widespread, so commonly held, that it never occurs to you to question them. I think we should all listen very, very closely right now. Because of the false beliefs you see the world and yourself in a distorted way. Your programming is so strong and the pressure of society so intense that you are literally trapped into perceiving the world in this distorted kind of way. There is no way out because you do not even have a suspicion that your perception is distorted, your thinking is wrong, and your beliefs are false. Look around and see if you can find a single genuinely happy person, fearless, free from insecurities, anxieties, tensions, worries. You would be lucky if you found one in a hundred thousand. This should lead you to be suspicious of the programming and the beliefs that you and they hold in common. 
but you've also been programmed not to suspect, not to doubt, just to trust the assumptions that you've been put into your, that have been put into your tradition, your culture, your society, your religion. And if you are not happy, you have been trained to blame yourself, not your programming, not your cultural inherited ideas and beliefs. What makes it even worse is the fact that most people are so brainwashed that they do not even realize how unhappy they are. Like a man in a dream who has no idea he's dreaming. What are these false beliefs that block you from happiness? Here are some examples. First, you cannot be happy without the things that you are attached to and you consider so precious. False. There is not a single moment in your life when you do not have everything that you need to be happy. Think of that for a minute. Okay, I will. There is not a single moment in my life which I don't have everything I need to be happy. I am blessed with existence, with the ability to witness what is in front of me. and with a openness to pay attention so I can learn something. The reason why you are unhappy is because you are focusing on what you do. The reason why you are so unhappy is because you are focusing on what you do not have rather than on what you have right now. More or less. Another belief, happiness is in the future. Not true. Right here and now, you are happy, and you do not know it because your false beliefs and your distorted perceptions have got you caught up in fears, anxieties, attachments, conflicts, guilt, and a host of games that you're programmed to play. If you would see through this, you would realize that you're happy and you do not know it. Yet another belief, happiness will come if you manage to change the situation you are in and the people around you. Not true. You simply squander, you stupidly squander so much energy trying to rearrange the world. If changing the world is your vocation in life, go right ahead and change it. But do not harbor the illusion that this is going to make you happy. What makes you happy or unhappy is not the world and the people around you, but the thinking in your head. As well, search for an eagle's nest on the bed of an ocean as you, you search for happiness in the world outside of you. Damn, that's so good. So, if it is happiness that you seek, you can stop wasting your energy trying to cure your baldness or build up an attractive body, change your residence or job or community or lifestyle or even your personality. Do you realize that you could change every one of these things? You could have the finest looks and the most charming personality and the most pleasant surroundings and still be unhappy. I do indeed have the finest of looks, the most pleasant of happy, the most pleasant, what do they call it? Most charming personality, yeah, that's me. And my surroundings are just lovely. I just love my apartment and they have not brought me happiness. Uh, I'm also hilarious, very, very funny, funny guy. Funny, funny guy, not enough for true happiness. Boy, how do we achieve happiness? And deep down, you know, that it is true, but still you waste your effort and energy trying to get what you know cannot make you happy. Another false belief. It is your desires. If all your desires are fulfilled, you will be happy. Not true. I know that. In fact, and yet I still desire things. In fact, it is these very desires and attachments that make you tense, frustrated, nervous, insecure, and fearful. Absolutely true. Make a list of all your attachments and desires, and to each of them say these words. Deep down in my heart, I know that even after I've got you, I will not get happiness. And ponder on the truth of these words. Fulfillment of desire can, at most, bring flashes of pleasure and excitement, but don't mistake that for happiness. What then is happiness? Very few people know and no one can tell you because happiness cannot be described. Can you describe light to people who have been sitting in darkness all their lives? Can you describe reality 
to someone in a dream. Understand your darkness and it will vanish. Then you know, then you will know what light is. Understand your nightmare for what it is and it will stop. Then you will wake up to reality. Understand your false beliefs and they will drop. Then you will know the taste of happiness. If people want happiness so badly, why don't they attempt to understand their false beliefs? First, because it never occurs to them to see them as false or even as beliefs. They see them as facts and reality. So deeply have they been programmed. Second, because they are scared to lose the only world they know. The world of desires, attachments, fears, social pressures, tensions, ambitions, worries, guilt, with flashes of pleasure and relief and excitement, which these things bring. That's brutal. This is brutal. I can barely read this. This is brutal. Think of someone who is afraid to let go of a nightmare because, after all, that is the only world he knows. There you have a picture of yourself and of other people. If you wish to attain lasting happiness, you must be ready to hate father, mother, even your own life, and to take leave of all your possessions. How? Not by renouncing them or giving them up, because what you give up violently, you are forever bound to, but rather seeing them for the nightmare they are. And then, whether you keep them or not, they will have lost their grip over you, their power to hurt you, and you'll be out of your dream at last, out of your darkness, your fear, your unhappiness. So spend some time seeing each of the things you cling to for what it really is, a nightmare that causes you excitement and pleasure on the one hand, but also worry, insecurity, tension, anxiety, fear, and happiness on the other. Father and mother, nightmare. Wife, children, brothers and sisters, nightmare. All your possessions, nightmare. Your life is as it is now, a nightmare. Every single thing you cling to and have convinced yourself you cannot be happy without nightmare. Every single thing you cling to and convince yourself you cannot be happy without nightmare. Excuse me, let me stare in my own eyeballs while I say that because this is the only person I'm really reading for and despite the terrific difficulty of internalizing the reality of these words. Uh, I'm gonna continue to push them into my brain because I trust the moment and the universe around me to provide me with what I need as I move through time. And I think this is what I need. Perhaps this is what you need as well. Every single thing you cling to and have convinced yourself you cannot be happy without nightmare. Every single thing you cling to and convince yourself you cannot be happy without nightmare. I mean, I should like break my computer and eat this book. Maybe. I don't think that's exactly what is meant in terms of the physical destruction of the things. But there is a subtle way to detangle, disentangle ourselves from these sorts of connections with things which will not last. And it seems appropriate that we disentangle ourselves with things that will not last before we get to the point that they are no more. Hey, I made that line up myself. Go me, okay. You will then hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, and even your own life. And you will so easily take leave of all your possessions. That is, you will stop clinging and thus have destroyed their capacity to hurt you. Then at last you will experience a mysterious state that cannot be described or uttered, the state of abiding happiness and peace. And you will understand how true it is 
that everyone who stops clinging to brothers or sisters, fathers, mothers, children, land or houses is repaid a hundred times over in gains and eternal life. I'll close the book now with these first two meditations. And still on them. It feels nice to engage in a kind of perennial contemplation that can center one during a time when all I really want to do is check Twitter. All right, I'm going to play a song, and uh, that will be Meta Dojo. Number four, the shirt is ridiculous. This song is called A Jar. Don't know if it's not written too long ago. More or less, too.